Good morning, and welcome to the set of Economic War Room with Kevin Freeman uh, here in Irving, Texas, where we are pleased to have, uh, with the permission of the host and his great team, commandeered the set for a special program. It's being brought to you by the Committee on the Present Danger China, of which I am uh, the vice chairman. I'm Frank Gaffney, also an executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy. Um, and we're joined, of course, by the host himself, Kevin Freeman, who is also a member of the Committee on the Present Danger of China, and two of our favorite partners in the effort to help the American people, some of whom are represented here in our studio audience, understand the character of the present and growing danger that is posed to our country, to our people, to our freedoms, um, to, well, more generally, Western civilization by the Chinese Communist Party and the country that it has been misruling now for 70 years. We're going to talk about many different aspects of the threat that the CCP, as it's often called, has become. We're going to talk about the degree to which this has been developing for years under our noses. We're going to be talking about the implications of these threats for everything from the quality of our lives to perhaps our lives themselves. And not least, we're going to be talking about how did this happen? And the incredible fact that in part it's happened because we've underwritten this great and growing threat. To do that with me, I am extremely pleased to say we've put together a first string set of experts and articulate champions for rising to this threat. And I will introduce them in turn in a moment. But let me just set the stage for this conversation by saying that the Committee on the Present Danger has something of a pedigree. In fact, the present incarnation, the Committee on the Present Danger of China, is very much inspired by and really modeled after one that was, I guess, the second of uh, three previous incarnations. It was put together in 1976 by a team of national security practitioners, subject matter experts, business leaders, uh, human rights champions, and religious freedom activists, among others. And they had, among others, as a member, a man by the name of Ronald Reagan, who turned to them in this period, in the run-up to his campaign to unseat the then incumbent president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, to help him think through and to craft, to articulate, and to socialize an alternative strategy for dealing with that time's existential threat to freedom, as he called it, namely the Soviet Union. And Reagan saw that the policies that had been practiced by successive presidents, going back to Lyndon Johnson, who began what came to be known as detente, an effort to try to fashion some kind of modus vivendi, um, an arrangement whereby we could coexist and prosper, perhaps, uh, basically by helping the Soviet Union prosper and become thereby, it was hoped, a more benign actor, uh, just a member of the international community. This policy of detente, as it was called, was pursued without much appreciable effect. It produced some arms control deals. It, um, got the Soviet Union some credit guarantees and some sales of grain and other stuff. But by and large, in terms of its stated purpose, it didn't help. If anything, what we saw was as the Soviets became wealthier, they became more intent on building up their military power, on campaigning around the world to subvert Western interests, um, indeed our own country as well. Ronald Reagan 
with the Committee on the President's Dangerous Help, fashioned what came to be known the Peace Through Strength Strategy. It ultimately had as its explicit purpose rolling back the Soviet Union rather than propping it up. And in due course, as the campaign unfolded and it's that proposition that we needed an alternative to Plan A, detente, began to get traction with the American people. It translated ultimately into a mandate for the elected president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, to pursue, to bring down the evil empire rather than continue to nurture it. The rest, ladies and gentlemen, as they say, is history. And it has brought us to the present moment where a new, relatively new, different, but similar existential threat to freedom in the form of communist China and the Chinese Communist Party is now very much a problem, indeed a vastly more serious problem for reasons we'll be discussing than the Soviet Union was in its heyday. So in this moment, the Committee on the Present Danger China aspires to do something similar to what its predecessor did to help define the threat raise awareness about it, present good ideas for what to do about it, socialize those ideas, we hope particularly in the course of this election season, where, as we're fond of saying, no matter who the next commander in chief is going to be, no matter what their political party is, their political philosophy, they are going to find job one, certainly in the national security space. And probably economic, and it seems likely to be public health as well. They're going to find this is job one. Not only reckoning with the threat posed by China, but contending with it. So to help us discuss what exactly that threat is, I am extraordinarily pleased to say we have with us a man who has spent his entire professional life defending this country, rising through the ranks of the United States Air Force to the position of a lieutenant general. His last duty station was right here in Texas, in San Antonio, the joint base there, where he commanded the Air Force Education and Training Command. He is a friend as well as a much admired colleague who has probably given as much thought and certainly as much creative recommending about what to do about this problem of China as anybody in or out of uniform. I'm sorry to say that at the moment he is out of uniform, having retired recently from the role that he played in the Air Force Education and Training Command, but we are thrilled to have him with us here today. And General Stephen Quast, thank you for your service to our country, which <coughs> continues now. Thank you. Out of uniform as a private individual. Um, we welcome you to this program and invite you to talk a little bit about how you see this present danger from China and the imperative of contending with it clearly and capably. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and it is an important conversation that the American people need to be aware of. And to put it into context, uh, similar to what you talked about, any time another civilization starts controlling their people, whether it's in the form of fascism or communism or any kind of collectivism, socialism, it starts taking away the freedom of individual people. And when you take away freedom, you crush the human spirit. The human spirit was designed to be free, to free to make choices, moral choices of good and bad, right and wrong, to show respect for other human beings. And so history repeats itself. Hitler rose, and we had to stop that controlling tyrant. Then we had the Soviet Union, and Reagan was able to bring that down with a strategy appropriate for the Soviet Union. And now we have China that is emerging in the same way. You look at the evidence of how they're treating the Uyghurs, how they're lying to their people about the coronavirus, how they're treating those in Hong Kong, how they control through social, social media your behavior through incentives, meaning if you don't act consistent with the party, 
You can't send your kids to the right schools. You can't buy the good groceries. You can't own a home. You can't get credit. You can't thrive. You can't prosper. This is a threat to America. And it's not just because they're controlling their people. We love the Chinese people. We, we want this to be a journey of peace. And as a national security professional, those of us that wear the uniform, our job is to be peacemakers. And you become a peacemaker by being so strategic and understanding your competition so well, culturally, socially, emotionally, that you design a strategy to win without ever having to fire a shot, without ever having to use violence. The use of violence is a failure because it denigrates this respect for every human being that is enshrined in our Constitution. But what we see with China, as a man who has studied them, I've read everything they've written, every speech they give, everything translated with the network of friends to make sure we do not miss anything in the way they organize, the way they train, the way they write doctrine. And I'm here to tell you that China has openly talked about the fact that a free society, an open system like America, is an existential threat to their survival. And that their goal is to bring back the Middle Kingdom. They still are so angry at the century of humiliation where the West, as they put it, the West killed their hero system by flooding their country with opium. It destroyed their people, it destroyed their dignity, and they are not going to take that. I can't blame them. But their leader is a open disciple of Lenin and Marxist philosophy. He is openly talking about controlling so that the party maintains control. That is his philosophy and the communist philosophy. But what makes this concerning is their strategy is different than Hitler's or the Soviet Union's. Their strategy is economic. They understand rightfully that the civilization that has the strongest economy is the civilization who can, can ensure that their values are abided by across the globe. And what we see in their behavior is their, their values are to lie, cheat, and steal to get any competitive advantage they need in order to dominate the market. And they have openly said that they are weaponizing the two vulnerabilities of Western civilization, energy and information. On the energy front, we know that we have built an entire energy grid that is, was never designed to be resilient or to be able to take a hit and keep on ticking. Yes, it can take a lightning strike here or there, but it's not designed for a determined enemy using the new techniques of directed energy that could paralyze not only our energy grid, but all of our equipment in the military or in civil society. And China is building a spatial network over the next number of years where they will have energy generation plants in space, both nuclear powered and solar powered, that can deliver energy to any point on planet Earth, that can be used for good, to provide affordable energy through a neural network to individuals on, planet, on the planet, or in a millisecond can use it for evil if somebody else is not there with them to hold them accountable if they behave badly. And then on the information front, I think America is starting to wake up to 5G. 5G is an example of how China behaves, both in the way they are intending to dominate information globally and in the way they use it as a weapon. The reason America has no company that can answer Huawei with 5G is because China lied, cheated, and st stole the intellectual property and proprietary information from Lucent Technologies, Motorola, and Nortel in the 2000s and bankrupt those companies and built Huawei out of the carcasses of those great companies. And their pattern is to steal the information, duplicate the technology, and then flood the markets so that they put out of business anybody that would be competitive with them. And they are doing that to America right now in the space industry, 
in the pharmaceutical industry, in the chip industry, the drone industry, the artificial intelligence industry, the quantum industry, the the, you, you name it, they are capturing those enterprises that benefit human beings in the digital age. So right now, it's not even just about the 5G network or infrastructure. It's about all the things that become the Internet of Things. You try to find a good drone made by an American company, it can't compete with the Chinese domination of that market. And they dominate the market for the same reason why America was not able to get 5G, because they the theft of intellectual property of those great American companies, then the duplication of that technology, and then the flooding of the market. Now, the weaponization of energy and information to control the global narrative so that they can crash our markets anytime they want by perpetuating a lie and not being able to let the truth get out, and their ability to paralyze our economy anytime, anywhere, at a time and place of their choosing, is their long-term goal. But they watched history, and they saw Pearl Harbor, and they know that they do not want to awaken the great giant of America because our open society, our free economy is so powerful at innovating, they know they cannot compete. Even with 1.4 billion people, they cannot compete. This is why their subtle strategy is to lie, cheat, and steal, to steal our magic sauce as an open society that respect other people and have a diversity of ideas in the mix to innovate more rapidly. They steal it and they get it to market faster and then they put our companies out of business. So this is an economic war. And you have to understand they are not like the Soviet Union who are more bold and more aggressive about stating their strategy. The Chinese are subtle and they do not want to trigger the threshold of American anger and that's why they work in the gray zone. They work under the threshold of our Congress or of our president. We love the Chinese people, but the Communist Party is suffocating the free spirit of humanity. And they are trying to make America go out with a whimper over a hundred year strategy to slowly and surely grow a vine around our spinal cord as a nation using energy and information to paralyze us, and it's over before we even wake up. This is the message the American people need to hear, and I look forward to the conversation about what you as an individual American can do to solve this problem, because you can do something, and that's the power of our open society, our free market, and the fact that we believe that every human being is created equal, whether you live in China or whether you live in America. Thank you. Thank you, General Quast. To basically build on that particular point about what is happening to the people of China, uh, we are blessed to have with us a man who has been incredibly tireless, I have to say, in assisting in a succession of these, we call them 2020 policy battle space threat briefings, because they're intended to try to help shape that battle space, most obviously and most immediately by informing voters about these vital choices, as I said, job one for the next commander in chief, but also to help us understand the sorts of things we need to do, as Kevin Freeman will be talking about, to end the practice of making all of these threats more serious. His name is Dr. Sean Lin. He has an extraordinary personal story. I've come to call him a trifecta in that he is a survivor of the Tiananmen Square Massacre, a practitioner of Falun Gong, a tradition that has made him and his co-religionists an enemy of the state in China, which is a very bad thing to be, as he'll describe. He also, interestingly and providentially, served in the United States Army for some nine years. Initially as an enlisted man, became a commissioned officer, and with his PhD in microbiology, ultimately came to become the director of 
a viral disease laboratory at Walter Reed. He is, in short, an extraordinary resource for the sorts of problems that we're talking about here, whether they're related to the specific danger that the Chinese Communist Party represents to its own people, or, for that matter, what it tells us about what a government that will treat them so badly might do to ours. Dr. Sean Lin, welcome. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, thank you, General. Thank you. And it's my uh, honor to be uh, here joining the panel to present about China's threat. And I'm really glad I uh, do my speech follow you, because you have very clear distinction on what is Chinese people was what is the Chinese Communist Party. So Chinese Communist Party actually is totally alien to Chinese people, total, totally alien to Chinese traditional culture. And they sneak into China in the early 20th centuries when the old Qing dynasty collapsed, when people would try to seek new ideologies, new way to, you know, to leave the society. Uh, Chinese people were so desperate needing some new ideas, so communists sneak in. But embedded in the communist gene, there are the violence, there are the lies in there. So the Communist Party keep lying to Chinese people all the time and use violence throughout the last 100 years, make Chinese people suffer so much. And when they, after they take power, we know very clearly more than 80 million of Chinese people die unnaturally under the communist regime. Because every five, 10 years, there are different political movements cracking down different sectors of the societies. Even just within uh, three years, between 1959 to 1961, more than 30 million Chinese people die, starving to death, because the Chinese government's terrible policy is called Great Leap Forward, try to catch up with the United States and the, and the United Kingdom, and causing so many farmers starving to death, and they actually lock down those farmers in the village. They don't allow these farmers to go outside even to beg for food. <coughs> Tragedies keep repeating in China under the communist regime. And like Frank mentioned, I was a survivor for the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. I was just a freshman in the college, and I was fortunate to join so many students and civilians you know, to protest against government's uh, corruption at the time. But on the night of the persecution, on, on the night of the massacre, we see Chinese PLA march into the Tiananmen Square, and they open the files. And you can hear the gunshot hitting the monuments. I was lucky enough to join with a large uh, group of students we stroll from the Tiananmen Square on the dawn of the June 4th, 1989. But when we're passing uh, the Chang'an Street heading north, tanks passing by, and students were scared. And one of the students petrified and fell down to the ground. The tank passed by and stopped, intentionally rolled back, crashed the student's head. It happened just kind of right in front of my eyes. We were so petrified, we were so stunned by this crime the Communist Party did to its own young people. And you never forget about this. You know, 30 years passed by, you never forget about this. So I was very young, but I have a clear taste of what Communist Party can do to its own people. And then 10 years later, when I already in the United States, uh, st study microbiology, and the Chinese government started to crack down uh, one of the largest religious group in China. It's called uh, Falun Gong or Falun Dafa. It's an ancient Chinese meditation system uh, centered around Buddha school teaching, uh, focused on the teaching of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. And it has five sets of exercises, kind of like Tai Chi and yoga, to improve people's physical condition. But even just because Falun Gong group grew even bigger than the Communist Party. They decided to crack down the group. Just imagine for in the United States, if you are in a bicycle group, your bicycle group is even bigger than the government allowed it. 
the government decided to crack it down. But because of the persecution, millions of people lost their job. So many people were put into detention center, labor camp, tortured. And one of the evil crimes they did is actually organ harvesting. So this is not a small scale organ harvesting done by uh, uh, gangsters. This is a Chinese government state sanctioned enterprise. Because they suddenly got about millions of people in the detention center, they realized they suddenly got a huge live organ bank. So they can test it, your blood type tissue matchings, collect all your biometric information, and they build a database nationwide. So when you, as a foreigner, you go to China for organ tourism, right, the transplant center had a demand, and they search the database, find a match, and then they go to the detention center labor camp, cure that prisoner of conscience. Take the organ, ship to the transplant center, make huge profit of it. That's how Chinese transplant center nowadays can advertise on their website. Come here, we promise you in two to four weeks, find you a kidney match. While in the United States, you usually wait two to four years, even if you're lucky, you can find a match. And if it's a liver transplant, they only need to wait one to two months in China. While in the United States, you need to wait 10 years. And the United States has the most sophisticated, matured donation system, donation registration system. Well, China, on traditional belief, people don't donate their organs. People believe we need to have an intact body even when we pass away. So Chinese government tried to say, we have enough donors, but that's an excuse because uh, you can see the pathetic number, how many people register as organ donors in China. And Chinese government also make excuse, they said we only use executed prisoners. But nationwide, every year, they only execute about 3,000 to 4,000 people. How do they account for tens of thousands of people went through organ transplantations in China? Where does this organ come from? So last year, the China Tribunal, which is an independent tribunal investigating about organ harvesting, and this was led by Sir uh, Jeffrey Nees in the United Kingdom. And their final conclusion, uh, this is organ harvesting is happening in large scale in China and it's still ongoing. It's a state sanctioned crime. And human rights lawyer David Mehta said this is an evil that the whole earth have not witnessed before. You kill innocent people and they make profit from their organs. And it's a nationwide industry billion dollar industry the Chinese government run. Military hospitals, civilian hospitals, all engage in this. Yeah. So can you imagine, this is how Chinese Communist Party can treat its own people. And they use this tactic, not only against Falun Gong petitioner, now this practice against to so many different religious groups. Uyghurs, Right, Muslims in Uyghur area in Xinjiang in China, and also Tibetan underground Christians. As long as you're incarcerated, you become part of the live organ bank in China. And last year, there was a coalition to advance uh, religious freedom in China established in DC. Because so many religious groups have to unite it, whether it's Tibetan Christians, Falun Gong petitioners. We have to unite it because Chinese government is waging a comprehensive war against all religions. The fundamental issue is the Communist Party is atheism, and it's against all religions. And they have used all kinds of measures to crack down people's belief, because any people have independent thinking, have this uh, desire for freedom, it's a threat to the Chinese government. Even in the in, even during the outbreak of this Wuhan coronavirus, right? At the beginning, when the uh, Wuhan city uh, locked down the, you know, this a big city about more than 15 million people, right? Many of the tax drivers, thousands of tax drivers, they organized, try to do you know, self-organized helping. The Chinese government canceled this operation because it's not government sanctioned operation. They don't want people to have the ability to organize themselves. That's how Chinese Communist Party run in the society. 
They want to control your mind. They don't want to control your self-support capabilities. Everything from your birth to your death, you need the Communist Party's approval. Just like the one-child policy, right? The government can allow you to have one kid or two kids. The government has authority. They are the God. They are the one above all your religious belief. They are the one to take who will be the reincarnated baby for Dalai Lama. Right? So they want to be the God behind all religions. That's a threat not only to the Chinese people. It's a threat to the whole civilization, the whole humanity, because they are the one try to be the God beyond all religions, beyond all deities. That's why a lot of times, we kind of sometimes feel that as a distance from, from China, you know. A lot of time people, people say, oh, the Communist Party can evolve, can change when you use a different foreign policy, right? Engage them, or appeasement, you know. Mm -hmm. You hope the Communist Party is a normal government. They can evolve, they can change with enough foreign pressure or even with uh, financial opportunity, let them join the international community. But no, the, the Communist Party's ideology is so evil, it will never change. They, they don't care people's life. The key issue for them is to maintain their own power. They are great on the power. So in this way, so many Chinese people die unnaturally, and then now they through their uh, barrel initiative and different technology, they are putting their threat globally. And so that's why we feel it's so important we're on this platform to address this threat comprehensively. And now you see from the public health aspect, the Wuhan uh, coronavirus outbreak is not just affecting China alone. So many countries around, right, also got so many cases happened. So it has the potential to develop into a full-blown pandemic. That's because Chinese government sealed the information in December and early January. They didn't tell Chinese people, didn't tell the world what exactly happened in China. Even doctors who exposed uh, the, the detection of the SARS-like disease in Wuhan, he was silenced. He was brought to the police station and he silenced and then later he died. That's why so many Chinese people are really mad about this cover-up of the true information and that brought the threat to the whole society, not just Chinese people, to the whole world. So just a quick summary that Chinese governments, you know, you can see how it treat Chinese people and you can imagine how it will treat United States people and how they present the threat to the whole world. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Lin. To wrap this up and to help explicate how on earth it could be that China is able to do all of these things. I mean, build a space-based power system on top of building out a colonial empire across the world under this Belt and Road Initiative, on top of the social credit system at home, which they're also exporting, on top of an immense military buildup, which is General Quas knows so well, is now posing not only a quantitative, but also qualitative challenge to our military and security. We're going to have the host of Economic War Room explain it all. How do they do this? Kevin Freeman, thank you for hosting us today. Thank you for the great work that you do at Blaze TV with Economic War Room with Kevin Freeman. Thank you for being uh, one of the founding members of this Committee on the Present Danger China, and not least a senior fellow with our Center for Security Policy, your great friend and very, very valued colleague. Over to you. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, the reality of it is uh, this is a spiritual war, and, and you heard uh, uh, both Dr. Lin and, and um, General Quast share that. It's a spiritual war manifesting as an economic war and it's going to spill out into a health war uh, with the coronavirus risks and the pandemic. It's gonna spill out into potentially a military shooting war if we're not careful. Um, I've got some statistics here. I've been studying Unrestricted Warfare, which is a book published by two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army in 1999. Now I wanna set the stage for you about 1999 versus today. You know, we're just two decades later. Uh, in 1999, China, was the world's seventh largest economy, seventh largest behind Italy and just above Canada. 
It was about one-tenth the size of the United States economy, and it was literally uh, today in Texas, the Texas economy today is 50% larger than the Chinese economy was just 20 years ago. Just Texas. So what has happened over the last 20 years that has made it possible for China to achieve all of these things, the Space Force, the control of their people, and all of that? Well, essentially, it's unrestricted warfare. This is literally the playbook. Uh, it includes uh, cyber theft and hacking which we're all aware of. I mean, you see repeatedly who, who hacked Equifax, it was the Chinese. It includes taking over uh, most favored nation status here in the United States through massive lobbying in Congress, uh, but also taking over global organizations and using uh, monetary means, bribes, and, and encouragements to get global organizations. It includes uh, intellectual property theft, currency manipulation. It includes Western investment, predatory trade practices, forced technology transfers. You see, China realizes that this is an economic war. They knew that as the seventh largest economy in the world, they would never be able to achieve their objective of being the dominant power within 100 years of the establishment of the Communist Party, which will, is coming up in 2045. And I also want to point out to you that the threat is very immediate, and it's immediate because of this. China realizes that you can commit an atrocity and 20 years later the world will forgive and forget. And sadly, the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre was an example of that. They were hosting the Olympics. Worldwide attention at the Beijing Summer Olympics 20 years after that massacre. And they realized that people today have long forgotten 9-11, which is less than 20 years ago. People, 9-11, eh, yeah, that was that bad thing that happened a while back. They realize 20 years. That means that they have to commit whatever atrocities they want to commit by the year 2025 so that they can be in the dominant position no later than 2045. This is a part of the Chinese plan. You see, what we see as a marketplace, which is stock markets and investing and, and developing global uh, interconnectedness, they see that as a battle space. And that's the mantra of the economic war room. I mean, every topic that we've talked about, we've covered on our show at one time or another, including the organ harvesting and how that's an economic weapon. They're taking their dissidents and they're literally taking organs and selling them for hard cash. Here, I'm going to read a quote from, uh, from Unrestricted Warfare. Thus, financial warfare is a form of non-military warfare, which is just as terribly destructive as a bloody war, but in which no actual blood is shed. We believe that before long, financial warfare will undoubtedly be an entry in the various types of dictionaries of official military jargon. Moreover, when people revised the history books on warfare in the early 21st century, the section on financial warfare will command the reader's utmost attention. The main protagonist in this section of the history book will not be a statesman, nor a military strategist, but it will be George Soros. The Chinese Communist Party has patterned their methodology of economic or financial warfare after George Soros, which includes manipulating financial markets. It includes using money as a weapon. They said the goal is, should be to use all means whatsoever, means that involve military power and means that do not involve military power, to force the enemy to serve one's own interests. And boy, have they taken that to heart. You see, there are just a few examples I'll give you, but they've been weaponizing the money of the American people and the United States government and American corporations, and they've been gathering it together and using it under their control to do all of these horrible things, including stealing our technology, stealing our industry, building a space force, and persecuting their own people. One example, it's one that we talked about, and now it's almost, it's five, a little over five years ago, and that was the largest IPO in history to the time, to that date, Alibaba. Alibaba is, I don't know how to describe it, think of it as an eBay and Amazon of China all rolled into one. And you think, well, that's good, it's free enterprise, it's, it's commerce, this is good, it should be good for the people. What you don't realize is that Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, was tied to the Chinese Communist Party, and it is used as a weapon against the rest of the world. And how did they do it? 
Well, they IPO'd $25 billion. They raised capital from our markets on the New York Stock Exchange, something the Hong Kong Stock Exchange would not allow because there was no transparency, no corporate governance, none of the things that would protect the shareholder were present. And they sold us shares in a Cayman Islands corporation that's called a variable interest entity. And a variable interest entity is literally a non-existent thing. They don't have any shareholder rights. They have no control of anything. And if the government allows, they may receive dividends or economic benefit from the shares, the underlying shares. But no non-Chinese can own Chinese corporations. So they created this, raised $25 billion. Then what did they do with the money? They took the money that we gave them and bought up companies in Silicon Valley. So what they weren't stealing, what they weren't committing uh, forced technology transfers, they were actually buying with the money that we presented to them. So some of the best and newest technologies that were emerging out of our innovative labs in Silicon Valley were being bought by a Chinese company and used for the benefit of the Chinese government. Now here's what's worst about it, is that we have no idea what that company is doing. They don't submit themselves to GAAP accounting, the generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, G-A-A-P. They don't submit themselves to our accounting. In fact, they say that Chinese companies' accounting is a national security asset and they don't release. We don't have good transparency to know if these are good investments or bad. I read an article just a couple of days ago where on the, the big day that they have, they have the, it's like Amazon Prime Day, the version in China, that they discount if, the, if something costs $5 and they discount it to $3, they count $5 of revenues. You couldn't do that in America. That's not legal. That's manipulation. We have no idea if Alibaba is doing a good, good thing or not. But Alibaba is not alone. I'm going to quote our colleague, Roger Robinson, who's spoken at a number of these events. He says, China has over 700 companies in our stock and bond markets or capital markets. It has about 86 companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange, about 62 in the NASDAQ, and over 500 in the murky, poorly regulated, over-the-counter market. Among these companies are some egregious bad actors, like Hikvision, for example, responsible for facial recognition technology that identifies and monitors the movement of the ethnic Uyghurs. It also produces the surveillance cameras placed atop the walls of the Chinese concentration camp holding as, two mi as many as two million Muslims. Both its parent company and Hikvision itself are on the U.S. Commerce Department entity list what many describe as the blacklist. We've sanctioned companies and yet we're putting these companies on our stock exchange where you all have invested in them through index funds and other things. Now I'm gonna take you to one step beyond that, which is one step worse and something the Committee on the Present Danger has been exposing. The Thrift Savings Plan of the United States, that is a 5.7 million enrollees, $578 billion in assets, 50 billion of that is allocated internationally. And it traditionally has gone into the EFA index, Europe, Australasia, Far East, developed countries around the world. So it's good. You're getting international exposure. I work for John Templeton, probably the pioneer of international investing. I think it's a good thing to invest internationally. However, they've convinced the committee to change from the EFA index to the MSCI All Country World Index. What that means is that means that all of a sudden the thrift savings plan, that $50 billion, is going to be invested in a different index that includes China. And then they lobbied the MSCI to increase the Chinese weighting dramatically. And so our servicemen and women, our veterans, our uh, patriotic employees of the government, and our retirees are going to be investing in Chinese companies, many of which have ties to the Communist Party or the People's Liberation Army, and can use that money to weaponize against us. They may be building weapons that our servicemen and women are investing money in the weapons being built aimed at them. It's tragic. Not only that, but Article 7 of the National Intelligence Law of China allows every commercial entity to be instantly weaponized to commit espionage, technology theft, or whatever else is deemed to be in China's national interest by simple order of the government. That's a matter of public record. In other words, the Chinese Communist Party at any time can take any Chinese com company and make them do whatever they want. And unfortunately, they do the same for American companies operating in China. And if you don't believe it, 
Look at the history of Google going into China and then coming out because they wouldn't do what China wanted. Now they've gone back in. Here's another example, BlackRock and Larry Fink. There's an excellent uh, letter that was written to, uh, by Chris Iacovella, the CEO of the American Securities Association, to the Securities Exchange Commission where he makes this point. BlackRock is pretty well known. It's $7.4 trillion of assets, the largest asset manager in the world, $7.4 trillion. It's enormous. And they're pretty well known because the CEO, Larry Fink, recently came out and said, we're no longer going to make returns given to our investors, the gains that you can make in the stock market, as our only goal and motive. From now on, we're going to start worrying about things that are good for society from his viewpoint. It's a part of the ESG movement, which is environmental social governance. And so he says, we're going to take your money and we're going to invest it so that we take care of uh, climate crisis, climate change, and we're going to address that. We're going to make sure that every board has uh, proper representation. So it's got to have women on the board and they've got to have, uh, you know, they're going to mandate the companies that they invest in basically follow their line, which is kind of like what uh, the Communist Party does. And corporate governance, we're going to hold to that. And yet, Larry Fink has also publicly said, as documented in the Wall Street Journal, we're going to make China our number one priority. We're going to grow in China as much as possible. We're going to invest in China as much as possible. Think about the hypocrisy of that. When BlackRock says we're going to make environmental our, uh, one of our top motives, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese nation is one of the worst polluters on the planet. They don't treat their society well. They don't offer fairness. If you are a dissident, you could have your organs harvested and sold. And they don't allow any corporate governance from the perspective of the shareholder. This is what the Chinese Communist Party has done. They have weaponized capital. They've gone into Wall Street, and they've gotten everybody excited about getting fees on the largest IPO in history, Alibaba, and they made hundreds of millions of dollars. And the Wall Street has essentially sided with the Chinese Communist Party against Main Street America, against our interests. And we're being held to a different strategy, a different level of of responsibility. The bottom line, the Chinese Communist Party is practicing unrestricted warfare. They're undermining our stock markets and they've weaponized our money against us. Now I have good things to share here. We have a solution. We need to weaponize American capital to protect America. The Pentagon recognizes this. The Pentagon realizes that a lot of the technologies we need for our military have been bought up by our adversaries and potential enemies. And so they've started a patriotic investors program where they're going to vet capital to make sure that when we're investing in that new military technology or capability, that it has patriotic Americans behind it and it is not something that's being siphoned off by China. This is a serious problem that they've recognized. It's also a huge opportunity for us as Americans because the innovation labs are here. We understand how to invest in innovation. So there's a group called AFWorks. They have 1,200 entrepreneurs and investors that need private funding modeled after the Doolittle Institute that would like to partner with some government money and some private funding to meet the needs of our military. And I had the opportunity to interview General Quast yesterday for an economic war room program. We talked about one of those projects uh, where uh, Shannon Stuckenberg has invented a new way to get water from air that doesn't cause pollution, doesn't desalinate and put too much salt in the ocean, that doesn't have any of the problems in obtaining water. And that is the type of investment an innovative American entrepreneur, and I can tell you, the Chinese have been in trying to buy that technology or invest in it so they could co-opt it. It's just one example. We need those innovations. Wall Street is a risk because they have deep China connections. So we enter with the NSIC Institute. National Security Investment Consultant Institute. It's a program that my colleagues and I started a few years back. Frank Gaffney has been a part of this. We want to help investments get patriotically placed. And how do we do that? Well, you don't know how to evaluate these. As an individual investor, it's hard to say, is this Chinese-led, Chinese-controlled? Is this patriotic? Is this helpful? So we're training financial advisors, stockbrokers, financial planners, investment advisors, 
We want them to understand how to delineate between investments that will be good for the world on our side of the spiritual battle, that will be liberty enhancing, and those that might be, have already fallen prey to Chinese control. So NSIC.org, National Security Investment Consultant. You can learn about some of this on the episodes Economic War Room uh, at economicwarroom.com. We have an action plan that we put. We'll put an action plan, a battle plan from this, this uh, event together, and we'll make that available for you. And, and what we see as a marketplace, our enemies view as a battle space, and that's happening right now. So if you got a financial advisor, tell them to go to nsic.org. We're partnering with Liberty University to get this message out. We want to promote liberty, personal economic liberty. We want to pro promote security, national security, cyber security, personal security, and values. Those Western civilization, Judeo-Christian values that uphold the traditions of the United States of America. So that's, that's the problem. China's funding everything and controlling the solution, we take our money back, we weaponize it, and we make it for liberty. Thanks, Frank. Kevin, thank you. That was super. Let me just add one other twist to this, and I, I, you may have touched on Kevin, but just to drill down for a second. Um, this colleague of ours, Chris Ayacavella, whose letter to the SEC is really required reading. We'll be posting it at our website, presentdangerchina.org, today. But he's also written a very interesting and, and quite alarming piece for uh, Real Clear Politics recently, in which he talks about the fact that not only are there the problems associated with investing our money with Chinese companies that are doing bad things, and in the handout that we've passed out here, you get a sense of some of them in the index of the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index, uh, managed, I believe, by uh, Larry Fink, if I'm not mistaken. This is a um, this is a is a short rendering of some of the companies that uh, are doing business through the MSCI with American investors. Um, Avic, a company that actually manufactures weapons with which to kill Americans. Hike Vision, one of the companies that's instrumental in the social credit system build out with a host of technologies. Uh, ZTE, a company that like Hike Vision has been so notorious in terms of its malevolent activities that the United States government has actually sanctioned it. Meaning, think about it, you're not allowed to do business with these companies. And yet, inexplicably, you can still invest in them. And then there are several others that are actually in the portfolios of at least one of the Texas public pension funds. The Texas Employee Retirement System that are involved in building out South China Sea Islands and the telecommunications networks that enable them to fortify them so they can control that strategic waterway through which roughly a trillion dollars worth of trade transits through the waters and over the air. These are companies that we should have nothing to do with, folks. But in addition to actually investing in them and actually thereby enabling some of their malevolent activities. As Chris Iacovella has pointed out, we have no idea really about their financial condition. As he put it, let me just read this. It's a, the opening paragraph of his piece in Real Clear Politics. Wall Street's exchange traded fund issuers and index providers have funneled billions of dollars of American investor money out of the US and into Chinese companies pushing the quote, you can't miss out on China growth, unquote narrative. The problem for investors is they have no insight into whether these companies are growing, profitable, or losing money because the Chinese Communist Party regularly asserts a national security privilege to prevent routine audits from taking place. 
This intentionally keeps investors in the dark and subjects them to a risk of fraud that is very real. He goes on to say, if you think this concern is misplaced, think again. Earlier this year, Kang Mai Pharmaceutical, a Chinese company included in the MSCI indexes, had over $4.4 billion go, quote, missing, unquote. While the company called it an accounting error, China's late to the party regulator called it a, quote, premeditated and malicious cheating of investors, unquote. That was one of the Chinese Communist Party's own regulators, folks. Albeit too late to protect investors, nonetheless made it clear that this was scandalous. What is no less scandalous, as Chris Iacovella points out, is that our SEC is enabling this kind of thing to take place. And Larry Fink and the Thrift Savings Plan and the MSCI more generally are all instruments of quite possibly defrauding vast numbers of Americans of their retirement savings. Let me just read one other thing from this letter from uh, Chris to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, he talks about an extraordinary fact. Um, let's see if I can find it. In terms of the extent to which, on top of all of this, the return on investment actually isn't all that good. As I recall, I can't find it, but I think he said that 37% less is being earned by these Chinese funds for investors than would have been done had they been investing in Standard & Poor's, I recall. We'll find it in corrected record if need be. But the point here, folks, is our money is being used to build the threat that we're talking about that represses the people of China and the rest of the world if they get their way and that is threatening our very survival as a country, not just as an economy, as a country, as a freedom-loving people, an existential threat to freedom of the first order, and as with the Soviet Union, we believe, and even more so, this one must be stopped. We must, at the minimum, stop enabling it. And beyond that, we must take steps to counteract it. So we'll talk a little bit about that amongst ourselves, and then we'll open this up to questions from you, if we may. Um, I wanted to start, if I could, um, General, with you. Uh, you've spent much of your professional career thinking about, working on, and really leading in the whole issue of space. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a secret, but you are no longer in the United States Air Force because you disagreed with the then Secretary of the Air Force about what a space force, which the President has made a priority of and is now enshrined in law, should look like. Talk a little bit about that, if you would, please. What we need, sir, in light of what the Chinese are doing to dominate space, mm -hmm. both for the purposes you've described and for what goes on on the ground as well, and what we need to be doing about it. Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, uh, it, it comes down to this. Uh, the, the strategy to move forward in our generation where we peacefully stop this from being a problem is really important. And having a bit vision big enough for America is important. So one of the ways of doing this, and this is how space gets involved in this, one of the national visions of China is this recognition that space is going to be the great marketplace of the 21st century. And the reason for that is because there is a wave of technology that's coming our way that we already see the beginnings of that is gonna be bigger than the invention of the internal combustion engine, the airplane, and the nuclear bomb combined, both in its power and in its ability to uplift the human condition. 
And those three waves are the ability to deliver energy to any point on planet Earth, pollution-free, and at pennies on the dollar of the way we deliver energy today. The second wave is the ability to bring water to people who need water so it cannot be weaponized or it can be weaponized because every technology can be used for evil or for good. And the third is the 5G example, but technology that allows you to communicate globally and control the narrative. These three waves of change that are coming across the human condition, across humanity, are, are really what's playing out before us. And so we can either start fighting this tactically by trying to stop any uh, evil Chinese company from getting involved in our finances, this economic war, or we can go on a vision that is economically driven, that is consistent with our values as a, as a society. And the vision is this, the technology for this vision that I'm gonna to describe to you right now exists today, and it would beat China at their own game. <clears throat> it would do uh, what Reagan did, and that is solve the problem without ever a, fire being, uh, a shot being fired. And the vision is this, the technologies exist to build this, we just have not built it. The vision is this, we as an American society could kickstart a trillion dollar economy with millions of jobs in the United States, delivering power delivered by the sun from space in safe and effective radio waves that can be absorbed at Earth for anybody that wants to be a customer. In other words, giving pollution-free energy to anybody on planet Earth for pennies on the dollar of what you have to pay today with the massive infrastructures and the linear way we deliver power. You could deliver fresh water to anybody on planet Earth the company that you were talking about, uh, Genesis Systems, is doing that right now using energy that is clean. And you can deliver information in new gateways that do not require the internet to be secure because the internet was never designed to be secure. Trying to make it secure, you're going to go bankrupt because it's, in its design, it was meant to be open and free. So you can provide abundant energy, which is the catalyst to all economic growth. You can uh, provide clean water, which is essential to all life and is the cause of most wars. And you can provide trusted information to anybody that shares our values of the respect for every human being. America could deliver that to the rest of the world and we would tap into trillion dollar markets to uplift the prosperity of America and all of our friends and we could avoid this fight with China altogether. But you have to unleash the magic sauce of America, the magic might of our free market and our entrepreneurs. And so government needs to be small so citizens can be big. We want, if we try to get a big government to do any of this, the citizen becomes small. We know that. We see it play out in history. And there's a moral component to this too. We are moral creatures. And everything that is in our constitution is founded in faith and there is a connection between faith and freedom that we really need to explore as an American people again. It would be as if we are in 1939 and we can see all of the people Hitler is murdering and we do nothing about it. When in reality we could, as an American society, do something about it. The crisis of Hitler was that we waited until it was too late and then we had to pay a high price in blood and treasure to fix that problem. Reagan was more clever and he fixed the Soviet Union problem without shedding blood. This country <clears throat> and one president needs to grab this strategy of economic might and design a vision big enough for the human race for the prosperity of America and all those that believe in our values of the respect for every human being. This can be done. <clears throat> and this is where America needs to demand it. Because Congress will not change unless the American people and their constituency force them to change. The Department of Defense and the government will not change unless Congress forces it to change. It all starts with you, the American people, demanding this. Thanks. Kevin, I want to pick up with you on something that the general alluded to in his opening remarks, and that is um, supply chains that are now very much dependent upon China's, well, uh, 
benevolence or simple productive capacity. And as we've heard from Sean Lynn, the latter is increasingly in some disarray because of the coronavirus. I wanted to specifically ask you to tease out something that you introduced me to, uh, was the subject of one of your best programs at Economic War Room, um, featuring Rosemary Gibson, the author of a book called China Rx. Talk, if you would, about the facts associated with our dependence as a nation on China for medicines and other you know, materials for managing diseases, including coronaviruses, and the prospect that that vital supply chain may be in real jeopardy at the moment. And what do we do about it? Yeah, it's absolutely in real jeopardy. Uh, Rosemary Gibson's brilliant author. She was an author for the American Medical Association. Uh, she studied uh, these issues for years, and she came up to me in, in, I guess it was about two years ago, and she said, you want to talk economic warfare, what if you found out that our hospitals cannot operate or exist without Chinese medicines or Chinese components? Now, when I think traditionally Chinese medicine, I'm thinking non-Western medicine, I'm thinking herbs and so forth, because that's, you know, that's what you get from naturalists and you go on the internet and so forth. And I said, no. Over the prior 20 years, and we're talking about since when unrestricted warfare was first written, from then till now, China, the Chinese Communist Party has made an effort to supplant the American pharmaceuticals industry and create a dependence. So using the same predatory trade practices that they've used in, in um, silicon chips and everything else, they use this so that we no long, longer manufacture vitamin C or aspirin or penicillin. In fact, 90% of the generic drugs that we take today have some form or another of a Chinese component, API, active pharmaceutical ingredient. And without those components, it's not possible to produce medicines in the United States. Now think of this and the importance of it because our military depends, for example, if there's an anthrax attack, we use Cipro in response. We don't make Cipro. We depend on the benevolence of China to provide that Cipro. We have put our military at mercy, and we do not have large stockpiles of military pharmaceuticals, nor do we have large stockpiles for our hospitals. There are some, but not sufficient. So there's a big concern that at some point in the not too distant future, if we continue to have this shutdown of manufacturing in China due to the virus, that we will be running short of medicines here in the United States. Now, we have active plans and we've been talking with people about re-engaging this critical national security item. We must produce the active pharmaceutical ingredient for our medicines here in America or with our allies at a minimum. But it is not acceptable for China to have control of that industry. And unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that in large part, they do right now. They do, and the difficulties associated with reconstituting the capacity that we've lost, especially in a circumstances in which we may confront here shortly, of an emergency, a pandemic, is a non-trivial problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Sean Lin, let me come to you. Um, you've given us a very compelling depiction of what's actually happening in China and what it means for the people of China, not just the faith communities, but, but all Chinese. That is not generally the perception of what's happening in China. Um, there's a very interesting policy dynamic at work at the moment where on the one hand, the Chinese are presenting themselves and, and you've described it very well, General, as you know, this developed nation with an extraordinary industrial capacity and leading edge technologies and capabilities that are now world-beating 
in some cases. And yet they claim to be a less developed nation for the purposes of getting access, among other things, to the funding of the World Bank. I've been told that 70 plus percent of the World Bank's lending to developing nations goes to China. That leaves 30% for the whole rest of the world. And I think President Trump has said, wait a minute, you're actually a developed nation. Well, what, what is up with that? But talk about the Chinese influence operations that obscure so much of what they're doing. You know, the, the hide and bide, I think, is what Deng Xiaoping called it. And you, you did touch on this earlier, but we're being kept mostly in the dark. I, I suspect even an informed audience like ours and, and this has been true, by the way. This is uh, the briefing that we've done following ones in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in South Carolina, in Nevada. Do you see a pattern here? We've gone to places where people are voting because we want this to be something that they're asking elected officials, particularly those who are candidates for commander-in-chief, to tell them, do they, you know about this? Well, by and large, they probably don't. They're certainly not talking about it. They're certainly not sharing with us what plans they have for dealing with it, partly because of influence operations. And, and you might start by mentioning a recent decision by the government of the United States with respect to some of the entities that tell us about China, or not, as the case may be. Yeah, glad to do that. And yeah, recently, the United States had to actually label five of the major Chinese uh, state-run media as a, uh, foreign delegation entities inside the United States. Because you remember last year, Chinese uh, Global TV Network, which is the English version of the Chinese CCTV, and it was uh, forced, it was demanded by the Department of Justice to register as a foreign agent under FARA, a Foreign Agent Registration Act. But this time it's a further step, and so they actually treat them as a foreign delegations, mm -hmm. because <laughs> because we know clearly uh, many of the journalists, so-called journalists, they actually has a espionage task on their shoulder as well. They are dual entity, dual identity at the same time, and so this is one of the important issue. Uh, I think the United States government start to pay more attention about this inf uh, influence uh, campaign. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, also related to uh, one of the issue you mentioned uh, in your speech uh, about the Chinese government always deceiving the Chinese people about uh, the opium war. They talk about Chinese people have suffered uh, so long under the foreign powers, influence, or, uh, or bullying. So that's why they try to use this uh, excuse to stimulate nationalism, the so-called patriotism inside China. Uh, so that people will follow the communist leading. But if you think, how many Chinese people die because of communism? Do they really love Chinese people? No, they are the aliens to the Chinese people, right? So it's the Communist Party who really torture the Chinese people. They are not the one who try to save the Chinese society. So this is actually totally uh, propaganda tools or, or their official tombs. And so I think the foreign countries, foreign governments do not buy this excuse. And so it's very important that the Chinese government's influence campaign, we can say all, overall their propaganda campaign, work in two aspects. One is inside China, how they brainwash Chinese people, and then outside, how do, how do they influence the global opinion about China's image. So what they call is called uh, China's rising soft power. And so they want to tell the world that China is changing under the uh, economy reform. They want to present a more democratic image. It's feel like uh, we we even start to engage some uh, election in the local village level. It seems like they try to present to the world we are making progress, but at the same time, they use a different tactic uh, to uh, influence uh, global opinions uh, through infiltration into think tank academies and so so academic, uh, institutes. academic institutes yeah so so Confucius Institute is one of very very clear example uh, uh, actually uh, the colleges the academic institute who sign agreement with Confucius Institute they have to oblige to, to not to mention about 
the Chinese government called it sensitive information regarding about um, Tibetan issue, Falun Gong issues. You, you cannot invite Dalai Lama, invite China. Falun Gong. Yeah. Yeah, and you cannot mention about Tiananmen uh, massacres. Actually, uh, related to military, even military uh, textbook regarding about China modern history didn't mention clearly about the uh, about the Tiananmen massacre, about modern history in China, because the textbook was written by some scholar who has has connection with China. There are two, there are two other points that just quickly more further mention. It's the great Chinese firewall. Yeah. that is helping with that brainwashing by restricting the information that the Chinese are able to get from the internet and other sources from the outside. And the yeah. other, just mention if you would, this business of the advertising supplements that the Chinese propaganda arms are able to place in our newspapers. Yeah, so you touch about two very important issues. The Great Firewall serve as a uh, gatekeeper to keep Chinese people inside and they, they feel like they, they can have the freedom now to, to browse the website of like New York Times, but you didn't know, uh, you actually missing some of the article that criticized Chinese government. So they create a false illusion not in so China. Not the New York Times. Uh, not the real, the not the real one that criticize, can criticize China. And of course they block all the independent media that really criticize China, right? So Great Firewall is one of the uh, very, very evil thing the Chinese government did to people, actually. Because so many people now live in this kind of illusion. They feel we have freedom now to assess information. So this is a very important issue. And then you mentioned about uh, exporting the propaganda to the American people through buying ads on US major media, like you know Washington Post. And so on a weekly basis, you see pages of pages of this information directly from China Xinhua News Agency. And you feel like maybe, if you didn't read the fine print, you thought this is a U.S. media report. And at the same time, another aspect of the campaign is Chinese government being heavily um, control, influence the Chinese language media because they want to control the Chinese American who already, you know, immigrated here. This is like incubating uh, espionage agents in the United States uh, because uh, all the major media uh, in Chinese language, more or less are controlled or, or, or directly by, by the Chinese government. Even though some of the journal, like in 1989, they can criticize Chinese government and the Chinese government use a tactic. They threw businessmen, bought this media, and now they no longer criticize Chinese government. And they also buy page of pages of information from China directly. Yeah. And, and it goes without saying that with the notable exception, I think, of the Epic Times and yeah. some of the other media outlets that are associated yeah. with the Falun Gong in this country. It is pretty much a closed shop. General, I, I want to just close with you. Um, you've given a lot of thought to what these kinds of operations in our country represent in terms of the theft of intellectual property, for one thing, but espionage more generally and influence operations, subversion, whether it's on our academic institutions, Harvard University, Yale University, notably these other, here in Texas, there are Confucius Institutes, I believe in many of their uh, universities. Um, the large numbers of Chinese students here, some of whom, not all, but some of whom are like the companies in China, obliged to provide espionage, collection, information, what have you, back to the mothership, the motherland, excuse mm -hmm. me. Uh, one of whom, by the way, is a fellow by the name of Yu Ben Meng, who it turns out has been part of the Thousand Talents program of China and is now running as the ch chief investment officer the largest state pension fund in America, the California Public Employees Retirement System. One of our friends in Washington, Congressman Jim Banks, has just written the governor of California, who along with, I believe, Governor Abbott and virtually, if not all of the other governors, was told by Mike Pompeo in a speech to the Governor's Association about three weeks ago, this is the kind of thing that the Chinese are doing to come after you in your states. Could you just talk a little bit about the, the cumulative effect that that has on both our economic strength as well as our national security. I, I would love to because this, this really goes to the art of understanding your competition. 
And if you understand the Chinese culture, uh, and I am uniquely qualified to look at that because I got to grow up in a different culture. I was raised in a, an African tribe with no electricity, no running water, and no education. And it helped me see clearly these divides between civilizations. And I will tell you that the Chinese civilization is a very, uh, the, the Communist Party is using a very subtle strategy. This subtle strategy is uh, to riddle our entire society with evidence that they can see that gives them opportunity. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Sorry about that if there's a little feedback. So the Chinese approach is to be very subtle and, and, and to plant in our society the censors and the influencers to control the narrative and to be able to control the economic future of China and America. So whether it's computer chips from China that have the back doors that are in all of your devices, uh, the uh, control systems on our nuclear power plants that uh, no longer have manual turn-on capability and are dependent on the technology of China for the running of our nuclear plants, to the drones that are flying around where the sensors have the back door so China can use artificial intelligence to aggregate that data and see what is happening in the American society. And, it, it, and if they can't outright buy a company, then they will get somebody, a, a proxy, that will get on the board of directors, or many of my friends in academia uh, will have a piece of research that's critical of China's uh, predatory theft and stealing and lying. And they'll tell me, I can't publish this because the benefactors that have Chinese ties would fire me as a professor from this university if I say anything that is unfriendly to China. So for us as an American people, we need to, one, wake up to the reality of what's happening. There's plenty of red flags. We talked about all kinds of them today, and we only touched the surface. But this is truly, uh, you know, as has been said so eloquently in the past, this is a 100-year marathon of subtle activity by China to slowly strangle us out with a whimper, economically. And so they are already riddled in our society. So one thing you can do is follow the money. And I know, uh, Kevin, you can talk about that, but uh, this, this, uh, this idea where you invest in things that are where America needs to go for our own survival and the survival of the human race against this Chinese threat, and that is energy, information, and water. And if you, but you don't just give your money to a company, you do the forensics and follow to see if there's Chinese ties because China has become more and more subtle. They saw what happened in the 2000s when they bankrupted Nortel, Lucent, and Motorola, and how many Americans were part of that uh, to include retired officers unwittingly, because it's not illegal to tell a company, I need to be on your board, here's some money, but I need your intellectual property. Most small upstarts uh, will say yes to that because they desperately need the money to survive, and they think, well, what's China going to do with my intellectual property until China bankrupts them? So for you as investors, investing in things that matter to the survival of this 21st century economy, energy, information, and water are the key elements, that the, the tides of technological change that are coming our way that haven't even been discovered fully yet because we're still living in an industrial age. You need to invest wisely with those forensics accountants that know how to follow the money and make sure you keep it in America, and we bring manufacturing back to America, we factor resilience of our society into our economic game plan. That's part of this economic war, where China has subtly forced us to be dependent, whether it's pharmaceuticals or chips for, for computers or artificial intelligence or quantum. We have to be independent, and even if it may cost a little bit more because we can't compete with the slave labor that China offers businesses, we must have independent uh, resilience as a society uh, to forge an economy. And we can do it because we are so innovative, so free thinking. We are the most creative society on planet Earth. And we don't see it as Americans because we're in our own culture. But if you're anywhere on planet Earth other than America, from a different culture, you fear America because of the might of our open society that respects people. Do we all need to use this mic or uh, the rest of us okay? 
We're good. Um, let me just segue to opening to any questions you might have uh, by reading this passage that I couldn't find earlier from Chris Iacovella's uh, letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission, because I think it, it, it builds on the point you just made, General. Um, this is in the context of uh, what the SEC is now looking at doing to try to prevent abuses of the proxy system, whereby a lot of this social engineering, if I can use that expression, of Wall Street is taking place. And it, it really focuses in on what the Larry Finks of Wall Street are doing to use the concentration of power to drive a political agenda, specifically, as Kevin's mentioned, this environment, social justice, governance agenda, ESG, which just doesn't happen to apply to China, mind you. And here's what he said. A recent case study emphasizes the enormous risk that Larry Fink's BlackRock's politics poses for investors. As reported by Bloomberg, the iShares MSCI USA ESG Select Social Index Fund, this is one of a number of these uh, uh, MSCI indexes, uh, which is one of the largest and most well-known ESG funds on the market, has trailed the Standard & Poor 500 index by 37 percentage points over the last 10 years. To many Americans, a 37% return on your savings can be the difference that allows you to retire early. I might add, retire at all. Or to tell your child that they won't have to take out loans for college. It is simply unconscionable that the largest asset managers are trying to use their market power to import the investment strategy that is underlying uh, something called SUSA, and I don't know what that stands for, maybe Kevin you do, uh, Select Social Index Fund, SUSA, um, to every other investment fund they manage. This is political warfare, folks, dressed up as finance, and we need to be in this fight, and this is a place where, as Kevin has suggested, you can play, and, and the general, you can play an important role by deciding whether your money is going to be invested patriotically for the betterment of our country, for innovation, for technology, for the military, for infrastructure building, the whole host of things that we can do in America that will strengthen this country instead of sending our money to countries that wish to destroy it. So with that, if anybody has any questions in our studio audience here, we would welcome them. We would uh, be happy to hear what you have to say. Yes, ma'am, please step up and okay. speak into that microphone. First of all, I'd like to thank you gentlemen for coming and speaking today. It was absolutely, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by what you had to say. And my question is that this has been going on or all of this for over 20 years that we know about it. The American people don't know very much at all about China. They don't. They get their things from Amazon made in China, but it doesn't mean anything to them. How is it that over the past 20 years, our government has not really talked about this or let the American people know or educated them what is going on? Because just with the Trump administration, we're beginning to learn about China mm -hmm. and about things that are going on. So my question is, what's going on in our government and our politicians? How much are they in bed with the Chinese to hide all of this or work with them? We know Joe Biden and Hunter Biden have some kind of a relationship there. I heard Joe Lieberman basically is a lobbyist of some sort for the Chinese. ZTE. So what is your theory on how we expose the people in government 
right now and let people know what what they're doing and how they're doing it. What do you what do you think we need to do? This is a great question, and I know all of us are champing at the bit to uh, to respond to it. If I could take the privileges of the chair, just a quick bit of good news. Um, one of the things that the Committee on the Present Danger of China has done to try to help inform the efforts we're making right here, among other places, and, and by the way, in addition to the states I've already mentioned, uh, we're heading to as many others as we can get to over the course of the next 10 months. We wanted a poll to sort of evaluate what do the American people know about China, and especially when they learn a little bit more about it, what do they think? Specifically, what do they think about what we should be doing as a government? And I think, and you'll hear from my colleagues, I know about you know, the, the role that the US government has mostly played to this point and why. The role that Wall Street has played, we've been talking about, and that impact on government. But I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement. This poll, which was conducted in the field at the end of January, we released it in the course of our threat briefing in New Hampshire two weeks ago now, it was conducted by John McLaughlin's firm, McLaughlin & Associates. Uh, this is one of the highest, I think, uh, high, most highly regarded firms, polling firms in the country. It happens to be President Trump's firm, among others. But I have had such um, high regard for it for so long that it was the obvious firm to go to, to try to evaluate what do Americans think. Um, we have both the top lines and the cross tabs on this poll at presentdangerchina.org. And it's stunning how sensible most Americans are, at least if this survey of 1,000 likely voters is representative, how sensible most of them are, just intuitively, let alone when they learn more as some of the questions provided some education. And here's the really important and encouraging news, folks. It wasn't just true of certain demographics, you know, conservative Republicans. It was basically across all of the demographic subgroups. And not just majorities, but strong majorities in most cases. So there's a lot to work with here. But as the question has suggested, we need to be doing a redoubled effort to educate them about why it is so vital that their government be doing it as well. Yeah, and sure. just a quick, quick, quick point on your question, because in times like this, we, we want to be careful to be forgiving and empathetic in the, in the fact that if, if China were a benevolent government system, meaning that they believed in the respect for all human beings and they believed in the same things we did as far as values, doing business with them is a good thing. It's healthy. International business is good if everybody plays by the rules that respect humanity and respect the environment. But we're discovering that they are acting inconsistent with our values, and they are, they are making the world toxic, and they are killing their people. Okay, so when we discover that, then we need to look clear-eyed at, okay, what is our responsibility to not enable that dysfunction in the human spirit? But Americans want to believe the best of other people. This is a, one of our strengths. We find a partner internationally, and we want to work with them until they prove us differently. And so we have to be a little bit forgiving that people wanted to partner with China and it looked like a good deal because China signed on the dotted line for the rule of law and the business practices that are reasonable. And then they lie, cheat, and steal and they go back on their word. Okay, So let's not tear ourselves apart as a society trying to blame somebody for this because China has been very, very clever at insidiously sneaking up on us without triggering our ire, our anger, that they are cheating. But now we know. So now it's our responsibility. What we do now as a society, the moral decision we make to stand up against evil is really important. It's essentially, as, as Reagan said, the evil empire for the Soviet Union to get the Cold War, to have the wall fall. We need to, as an American society, acknowledge we have an evil kingdom 
in the Communist Party of China that we have to stop, and it's a moral journey. Amen. Thank you. And I'd probably talk from the two aspects. Yeah, I'm sorry. Doubling. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one important aspect is actually uh, for public to know information, to know true information, it probably through the media, right? So, Chinese government in the 1990s had a strategy to repackage their propaganda machine. Because in the past, the Chinese propaganda, just like Soviet Union propaganda, is you know, very blatant. You know it's propaganda. In the 90s, they repackaged it into a news agency operation. So the new name is Xinhua News Agency. So globally, major news outlets subscribe to the Xinhua News Agency, and they package their propaganda into the news service format. Even Associated Press had a deal with uh, Xinhua News Agency. Yeah, so they're regularly receiving this information from Chinese government official source. So your mind, your opinion on, on China is already subtly changed when you receive so many information from China. So that's one important strategy the Chinese government been doing. And it's so, so tricky, so important to manipulate your uh, mind. And at the same time, uh, they heavily infiltrated the uh, United States uh, Academy Institution, think tank, and presenting the China rising image. This is very important. And, and also in Washington, D.C., there's huge China lobby. This is, this is the establishment group, do the China lobby, and they call them Panda Hugger. Right? Panda Hugger. Oh, it sounds so benign, right? You love a loving um, panda. But actually, what you're hugging is actually the evil dragon of the communist party, right? But <laughs> when you present, when you package like a panda hugger, it's very different. Yeah, so that's why it's, it's so tr many tricky in, in the propaganda. And also uh, a wrong foreign policy was started even in the late 60s and 70s. And when, Harry, uh, when Kissinger's and Nixon's reached out to China, but at the time, the Chinese Communist Party was actually at the brink of collapse because of the terrible Cultural Revolution. They already lost the legitimacy to rule China at the time, but the wrong foreign policy actually gave the Communist Party another 40, 50 years to further rule China and torture more Chinese people. Yeah, so it's a terrible mistake, and we hope uh, this new administration, uh, the coming commanders, will fully understand what kind of uh, consequence it would be if you have a terrible foreign policy. Yeah. Don't bail them out again, Kevin. Yeah. All right, just one other point here. I've, I've seen firsthand <coughs> the very things that you shared. Uh, you know, in Washington, I'd go in and, and there would be the, uh, Michael Swain from, uh, from the Carnegie Institute for World Peace, and he would have the panda-hugging approach. And, and you know, face-to-face -face in the Defense Intelligence Agency, you know, here I'm an investment manager from Texas, and here is the distinguished Dr. Swain, and, and his view... His, his was completely bought off, in my opinion. And he brought with him the number two of the World Bank, who was Chinese. Uh, the, the, so we had a debate, and we had a discussion at the, at the DIA with General Flynn there. Uh, but probably the most insidious aspect of all this, the one that really gets me, is the infiltration into Hollywood. <laughs> and if you understand that uh, upstream of life is politics, politics determines how we live. But upstream of politics is culture, and culture determines politics. And upstream of culture is entertainment. And so if you wonder why it is that our society has changed as it has, just look at the television programming. Look at the movies that are allowed. And the Chinese understood this. And they've invested heavily in American theater chains, in American studios, in scripts. They finance a lot of the movies that we get. You cannot make a movie. And now they've opened up China uh, prior to the virus because now the movie attendance has collapsed in China. Nobody wants to go out to a theater. But prior to the virus, uh, the Chinese box office was bigger and more important than the American box office. And you know, I will mention, for example, to, to our audience here and to a lot of the people watching, hey, do you remember the great actor Richard Gere? Hmm. And people, oh yeah, he's a great actor. What an amazing, nice looking guy. He's starring in all these romantic comedies and all these tremendous movies. What a great guy. Mention to my kids and their generation, they say, who? Where did he go? What happened to Richard Gere? I'll tell you what happened. 
He's a friend of the Dalai Lama, and therefore he's forbidden to a Chinese audience. You can't support Richard Gere. So he's been banned from any major motion picture. How do you take a great, well-known actor? The same way that you take the new Top Gun movie that's coming out, and you make sure that Taiwan patch and the Japan patch are not on his leather jacket. And you demand that because you're China. And if you don't have the Chinese box office, you can't make a movie. So they've infiltrated Hollywood as well. And that's culturally how they have hit the American mindset. And you've seen it in all these other areas. This is one you probably haven't seen, but you need to be aware of. Amen. Well, I know that Kevin Freeman actually has to get back to his day job. And this studio has to go back to being the economic war room with Kevin Freeman. So we're going to wrap uh, this particular 2020 policy battle space threat briefing of the Committee on the Present Danger China up at this moment and uh, to say thanks to, again, all of you for being here, especially those of you joining us by live stream and video. And uh, our, of course, our terrific panel, General Quast, Dr. Lin, Kevin Freeman, uh, thank you for your tireless efforts on behalf of uh, awakening the American people to the challenge, the present and growing danger of communist China, and for your leadership in helping us take the steps we need to to assure that we, as a previous generation did, defeat the existential threat to freedom of our time. Thank you very much for joining us. Well done. <laughs>